We teach beginning photographers lots of rules to try to simplify the art of photography, but it's really easy to get stuck into these rules, and I know I do it, and you end up taking amateurish photos. So we wanted to talk about some of the ways that you can be more pro by breaking those rules that you learned. This is not beginner content, this is for the advanced people. I think beginners can understand it too though, so stay tuned because we're going to be talking about rules you probably learned and when and how to break them. That's important. You can't just be doing it willy-nilly. But first, let's talk about our sponsor, Squarespace. Whether you need your own portfolio or website, Squarespace can make it happen and it's very, very easy to do. And you can get it for 14 days for free and there's no credit card needed. Just use the link in the description down below. It's squarespace.com slash Chelsea. And to get 10% off, you can use the coupon code Chelsea. That's C-H-E-L-S-E-A. Thanks, Squarespace. And let's talk about the reciprocal rule, which exists to try to help people get sharp pictures. Yeah. How many times have you been taking photos as a beginner and you can't figure out why something is blurry? I get these emails and messages all the time. What's wrong with my photo? Why is it blurry? Is it my camera? And oftentimes it's either camera shake or motion blur because one of the first things we have to learn is how to control our shutter speed. So we have the reciprocal rule pop up that tries to show people the basic shutter speed they should have to have sharp photos. If you're not familiar, you take the focal length you're shooting at, such as 50 millimeters, and you take the reciprocal of that, so 1 50th, and you want to use that as your shutter speed or faster. And that's supposed to ensure sharp pictures. First, that's from the film era, so it doesn't really work anymore because modern cameras almost always have one or more forms of stabilization, but modern cameras also have super high megapixels, which yeah. might show shake even at much faster shutter speeds, so it kind of goes out the window. But at some point, you learn what shutter speed you can handhold something at and eliminate camera shake, and that might be faster or slower. Yeah, and I also think with all of these rules that we're going to be talking about, it's the intention of the rule and you have to kind of start thinking bigger than the rule itself. So with shutter speed, of course you want some things to be sharp, but there's also a time for there to be motion blur in your photos and that's pretty much whenever you're photographing action. So we have a photo here of fire twirlers that we saw and we could have went with a super high shutter speed and frozen the motion but the motion was the interesting part of the scene. So instead, you experiment with your shutter speed until you get these trails of light, and it shows more motion in the photo, and it's more interesting. Another really common example of this is waterfalls. Um, people go to waterfalls and they take pictures, and you can crank that shutter speed up to like one two thousandth of a second and perfectly freeze the water. That might be interesting, but really what's beautiful about a waterfall is the movement of the water. And so in that instance, you would want a slow shutter speed so you get this beautiful feathery water and that way you're showing not only motion, but a leading line in your photo. And so you're taking this intention of the rule and understanding in this situation, it might not apply. I like car photography yeah. and I see car photos all the time where somebody has gone to great lengths to photograph this awesome car driving down this hilly road with the sun setting in the background, but mm -hmm. then they're at one two thousandths of a second and it looks like the car is just parked in the middle of the road. You have to find that sweet spot where you show just a little bit of motion in the wheels and actually convey that action. And you know what? The picture's not going to be that sharp as if you shot at a fast shutter speed. And that's okay because the feeling matters more than the technical sharpness and that's something beginners don't get but more advanced photographers do. I think that can be difficult for people because especially when you're in a community where everyone's learning, like the photography community, you're gonna get comments where maybe you take a slower picture of a drummer to show the action and the drumsticks and someone's gonna say, his eye's not sharp. And it might feel like, wait, did I do something wrong? Um, not everybody's an expert. Not everybody's going to agree with your artistic choices, but you're going to have to just understand that you're going to have to experiment and see what works for you and be okay with the fact that you don't always get technical perfection when you're getting a better photo. For my next point, I want to talk about exposure. Back, especially in the film era, getting just the right exposure was a real challenge. Everybody yeah. had to learn the exposure triangle, ISO, aperture, shutter speed, ah. And <laughs> if you took a picture that was too bright, it was just like ruined. But nowadays, it's not that big of a deal. And I start to see a lot of pictures where people have nailed the exposure, but it's a boring, low contrast 
shot. Yeah, this is again, I think a repeating theme is going to be, it's about the intention and the mood of the photo and the intention of the rule. So you have to know when to break it. And there are definitely times to have a photo that would be technically underexposed. If you looked at the histogram, an example of that would be a silhouette. For a silhouette, it's common for me to expose for the bright sky or the sunset mm -hmm. to show those details and let the actual foreground subject disappear into the shadows. And I will sometimes do the opposite, where I'll be photographing someone with, say, an overcast sky behind them. And I'll expose for the face and let all the details in the clouds just completely get blown out and go to white. Yeah, so I think that what you want to do is basically expose for your subject. If you're taking a photo of a silhouette and you don't want to show the detail of the building, you want to show the outline and the shape, then you don't need that detail there. That's your choice to make. So there's a time and a place. And you can think about mood, too. You know, you watch scary movies like me. You notice that what's scarier than there being almost complete darkness? So there's that suspense. What is in the shadows? That's something you can think about with your photos, too. If it's creepy, you don't want a perfectly exposed, creepy photo. You want darkness. You want it to be spooky. So think about the mood of your photo, and then you can think about your exposure. You should know how to properly expose your photo, but you have to know when to break that rule as well. If you do adjust the exposure of the photo to show all the highlights and all the shadows, what you end up with is a low contrast, mm -hmm. washed out looking photo. And especially nowadays, people really like to see that contrast. Contrast can be nice. Okay, I have a little bit of a controversial one, and this is color balance. And I say this because every time I see a color graded, a highly color graded photo, there will be people in the comments like, why is it green, or why is it blue, or why is it red? And um, I understand why they're saying that, and it's because we've been taught to perfectly correct all of the colors in photos so that they're quote unquote true to life, you know? And that makes sense. If you're taking a corporate headshot, you absolutely want the person's skin tones to be true to life. You don't want them to look blue and cold. You don't want them to look green. You, you travel around with that little card that has all the colors on it, yeah. and you take it, and then you balance it with your spider color monitor. Yes, yeah, exactly. Thing. You have yeah. your little gray card, and you want everything to be perfect, and that's something that we have to learn is how to get true to life colors when we're taking photos. But what happens when you're taking it to the next level, when you actually want your color to be a part of the photo? Because that happens all the time and it's important. Um, if you're shooting Game of Thrones and you're in the north and you want to show that it's cold, you're going to grade all of the colors so that it's blue and it looks cold and it feels cold. And you might do the same thing with a portrait if the person's trying to look cold emotionally or if they're trying to look heartless, like if they're like a fighter or something, you might use those colors to try to tell the audience more about who they are as a person. And that's an artistic choice that you have to make and it has to be an intelligent choice. You can't just go all crazy with the colors and have them messed up from incandescent lighting and then say you meant to do that. It's something that you think about before you take your photo and then you make sure that it happens in your photo. But what about color science? I thought color science was so important. I think color science can be important, but then, you know, when you're going to edit it, you're going to make them your own. It is nice to start with a clean default so mm -hmm. that then you can take it anywhere. But at the same time, when I've gotten photos that were a little off, it's like, I don't care because I'm going to end up adjusting all the colors anyway. Yeah. So we have an example here, a picture that Tony took of me, and I'm in a white dress, I'm in front of a window, and everything is just orange and backlit. Uh, it's not true to color. The colors are not correct, technically. My white dress looks orange, but it sets this whole mood. It looks like I'm on a beach or something, being backlit by the summer sun. It looks really warm. It has this really nice mood to it. I'm, but, you know, if you were in a corporate office environment and you had a white dress on and it looked yellow, it wouldn't register as a sunset. It would register as, oh, they have ugly office lights. Yeah, exactly. So then the mood and setting need to factor into the color. Okay. Coming up, we're going to be talking about composition. And this is a big one because we're going to find out if you're overusing the rule of thirds, like Tony. <laughs> 
Are you relying on social media to communicate your photographic skills or your business presence? You really shouldn't. You should have your own website that you fully control and Squarespace is the right way to do that. Try it out for free. Go to squarespace.com slash Chelsea. Set up your portfolio, set up your business website, drag your pictures in, talk a little bit about yourself. It's incredibly easy to make a gorgeous website. And then if you love it, after your 14 day free trial, use the coupon code Chelsea to sign up. Thanks Squarespace. All right, so let's talk about composition. This is absolutely so important to learn. It's one of the first things we teach in our photography book, Stunning Digital Photography. And that's because composition can create storytelling. Composition can balance your photos. Composition can uh, like bring your viewer's eye to your subject. It's really, really important. And we ended up kind of simplifying it with some basic composition tricks. One of them is the rule of thirds. When I was a kid, our family had those point-and-shoot cameras. Yeah. And I remember it had a little circle dead center in the middle of the frame. And that is where it focused, and that is where it determined exposure. And if you looked at the instruction manual, it said, put your subject's face dead center on that circle. And all cameras were like that. We had this entire generation of photos where the subject was always dead center in the middle of your little 4 by 6 inch print. And because it became so common, it became very boring. And to try to break photographers out of this trend, I think we came up with the rule of thirds, which states that you draw a little tic-tac-toe board over your photo and you put your subject on one of those cross points. So everything is always a little bit off center. And I, I took this rule so seriously, especially like for the first decade of my photographic yeah. career. Every photo from that time, the subject was in the left or the right third of the picture. And when I go back and I use those photos now, if I share them on social media, I end up cropping it so the subject is dead center. Because styles have changed, but also it was never really the right thing to do. It's a little weird to have something off center without a good explanation for it. Yeah. Well, so, it, there is a time and a place for it. Like your composition kind of dictates where your viewer's eye is looking. And I think putting something off center makes them look around the scene a little bit more. Um, when you have something dead center, it's like, boom, you're seeing it and your eye doesn't really move around as much. And so it, your composition, it depends on whether or not you're trying to show the rest of the scene or if they're just focusing on the subject or, you know, there's got to be some storytelling in there. Yeah, and I think if it's a landscape photo mm -hmm. where you're tying together foreground and background elements, rule of thirds is a great way to go. If it's a wildlife photo or a portrait, you probably just want to put your subject dead center because why would you want the composition to actually distract from the subject of the photo? Like yeah. make it clear front and center, especially in the area of social media when we're consuming images on very small screens. You don't necessarily want to waste the little amount of real estate that you have by creating negative space that isn't conveying anything about your subject. I think that composition is more complex and a really good way to understand composition more is to study art that you like, uh, not just photography but paintings especially, and start thinking about where the composition brings your eye. And a lot of the time you'll see it pulls your eye through the scene because you're supposed to observe multiple parts of the scene and then you can start applying that to your own photos. So take your dead center picture, take your rule of thirds picture, and then play a little bit. Take a bunch of different pictures with different creative compositions and see if you can come up with something interesting and new. Our next rule is leveling the horizon. And when we did our live show, we must have told so many people to level the horizon uh, because that can be a challenge when you're first learning photography. In first, fact, I have never taken a photo with a level horizon. It doesn't matter if I'm, I have that little thing in the viewfinder that yeah. shows me what's level or if I have a bubble level on the tripod. I'm always a little bit off level. I am too. I do, but I level them in post if that's how they're supposed to be. And you'll see there's like a bubble level on your tripod. Like this is a big issue. You can look through the viewfinder and they have the line that Tony was talking about. Um, but there's a time and a place for a level horizon. I will say, make this one deliberate. If you're going to make your photo not level, then it should be a very deliberate choice. This is actually a really commonly implemented rule breaking thing because there's actually a name for it and it's the Dutch tilt or the Dutch angle and that's when uh, a photo or an image is tilted to the side. And you'll usually see it in like scary movies or superhero movies use it a lot. 
Uh, they'll take the villain and they'll often put them off level because it feels like, it feels weird. It makes you think, oh, something's not right about them. Um, or maybe if someone's disoriented, like I've seen pictures of drunk people and it's off level, it's like telling you what the person you're taking a picture of is feeling. Everything's kind of crooked. So when you take a picture, if you're taking a landscape picture, you probably want it to be completely level. If you're taking a picture of a person and you're trying to convey a mood like creepy or fun or a villain, then you might want to play with that Dutch angle. And uh, I have a picture here of a church and it's through a little crucifix and I wanted it to look a little bit creepy. So I kind of put it askew and put it black and white and a little bit gritty and you get a whole different mood. So again, play with that. Get your level photo, get it out of the way, and then play with all sorts of tilts and angles and see what you come up with. For my final point, I want to talk about balance in composition, which is actually a pretty complex compositional technique to teach. We try to teach people to have a certain amount of weight on both the left and the right side of the photo, the top and the bottom, because if you have photos where all the visual weight is in the left corner, it tends to look weird. And yeah. that's a mistake that a lot of beginners make and the picture is just generally unappealing. I think we like very simply deal with this by doing a lot of symmetry because a very symmetri symmetrical photo can be really appealing. Um, but then balancing a photo gets very complicated because you're not, you don't just balance things with two objects. So let's say like a person on one side and a person on the other side perfectly balanced. Color also has weight. So if one person is wearing all black and the other person's wearing bright red, now you have an imbalance. And so learning to balance a photo is pretty complicated. Uh, and it's a, it's a really complex way to make a good composition. So this is kind of a difficult rule to get used to breaking. Yeah, it's something you have to be advanced to even master, much less break the rule. But some of the most striking images ever made have been extremely unbalanced, where the subject is in one corner of the frame and the rest of the frame is all negative space. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you only see half of the subject's face because it's cropped off at the edge of the frame. That is the definition of unbalanced, but it also draws your eye right to it because your eye wants to see novel things. Your brain wants to explore things that it's never seen before. And you can't really do this as a beginner or that's going to kind of come across. But once you've mastered balance and negative space, then you should try to work on the art of creating unbalanced images. Yeah, you know what I've noticed is actually I like beginner photos before people know the rules because they're doing all these crazy things because they don't know what they're doing wrong. And I find that more interesting. And there's like this difficult part of photography you have to go through when you're learning where you're trying to do all the rules at once and things can get very stiff and boring because you just want to do things the right way and you want to do things the pro way and you don't want to look like a noob but I think that that final phase you have to get into is being like okay I learned the rules now I have to go back to just being a little more free like a beginner would be and know when to break the rules and know how to get it sharp but when not to how can I like balance the color and then when do I break it and that's kind of like the essence of what we're talking about. You got to get to that third stage. Yeah, it is very advanced. You have to take those risks and those risks are going to be breaking some of these rules so just go for it. Well here's my compromise. I'll take a picture following all the rules yeah. and then I'll take a second shot that experiments with it and yeah. then I can decide later whether I pull it off or not. Yeah, that's kind of what I've been suggesting. Like get your level photos, get your properly exposed ones then have fun, play, put, like enjoy it again. Don't worry so much, you know? This is photography, not neurosurgery. In the comments down below, I'd like to hear the rules that you have followed too strictly and the rules that you've broken with success. What are other rules that people should start breaking a little more often? And check out our sponsor, Squarespace, for any sort of website that you need. You can get your own domain, you can get your own private email address, so everything is not at gmail.com, which seems very amateur oh, to yeah. me. Okay. Go to squarespace.com slash Chelsea. Set up your website, set up a store, take online appointments, and when you love it, use the coupon code Chelsea to get 10% off. Thank you, Squarespace. Thanks, and thanks so much for watching the Picture This Photography podcast. If you want to see more episodes, you can get our podcast anywhere podcasts are available, or you can just subscribe to our YouTube channel. We put out two per month. Your support means so much to us, so thanks so much, and have a great day. Thanks.